I want to talk in this segment about Greek tragedy. I'm going to focus on a single play by one of the three great Greek tragedians. This is Aeschylus. Um, I'm going to focus on the first play in his trilogy. The trilogy is called Oresteia. The first play in this trilogy uh, is called Agamemnon. It's named after King Agamemnon. And as we look at this, we begin to understand tragedy as a literary genre, but we also begin to get insight into human nature, the tragic dimension of uh, human nature. Now, Agamemnon was the leader of the Greek expedition of a thousand ships that um, went to Troy, sacked Troy, destroyed Troy, burned Troy, uh, and brought Helen back uh, to Greece. And uh, Greek tragedy is defined by taking this material of myth and, um, and focusing in on it. Uh, in no way does Aeschylus try to cover the Trojan War. In fact, he's covering an episode in this play Agamemnon that happens after the Trojan War. So during the Trojan War, while the Greeks were fighting the Trojans, they committed some terrible atrocities. And I want to mention three. First, when King Priam, the Trojan king, fled to the temple of Zeus for protection. Now, this is a king going into the temple of a god. It is considered sacrilegious to go in there and kill him on the temple. And yet that's what the Greeks did. Atrocity number one. Uh, Priam's daughter, Cassandra, was raped by the Greek warrior Ajax. This is um, a warrior named Ajax the Younger. Uh, and this defilement of the daughter of a king is atrocity number two. And number three, the Trojan warrior Hector had a young son, a baby, a child named Astyanax, and the Greeks grabbed this kid and flung him from the battlements to his death. Now, these atrocities went above and beyond the normal carnage of war. And in the story of the Trojan War, the gods, the Greek gods, became extremely angry. They had actually urged the Greeks to do the expedition, but they became angry and they decided to punish a lot of the Greek warriors, either uh, by what would happen to them after the war, or that they would be essentially condemned and lost at sea. Odysseus himself, the Greek warrior, was at sea, was away for years. He didn't get back for 20 years. Uh, from the Greek expedition. And when he got back, there was all kinds of trouble at home. That's the plot of the Odyssey. Well, we're going to focus on Agamemnon, the Greek king, because when he came back, it turned out that his wife Clytemnestra had taken up with another man named Aegisthus. And the two of them planned together to murder Agamemnon. That's the plot of Agamemnon. It's a gruesome murder. Now, like a lot of Greek tragedy, the murder occurs off stage, uh, but you hear about it and uh, it's almost unbearable to listen to. In fact, Clytemnestra talks about Agamemnon's blood uh, splashing all over her and she loves it. She says, basically to me, it was like a plant being watered in the spring. I mean, think about that. Now, you might ask, um, why would Clytemnestra want to murder Agamemnon? Is it because, you know, she's having this affair, has taken up with this other man? Well, it turns out that's not the case. Her motive is much deeper than that. In fact, it's revenge. Before the Greek king Agamemnon went to Troy, he sacrificed, he murdered his own daughter, Iphigenia, as a sacrifice to the gods to give him success in the battle at Troy. Think about that. Um, and naturally, the child, the uh, young girl's mother, Clytemnestra, so this is why she has the affair. This is why she allies herself with uh, Aegisthus to murder Agamemnon. It's to take revenge for the killing of Iphigenia. Now, as in Greek tragedy, uh, when you think you figured something out, things kind of get a lot deeper. And we now have to turn to Agamemnon's own motives and why he would do, such a, as a father, something so absolutely horrific. It turns out that once Helen has been taken to Troy, Agamemnon goes to Zeus, the greatest of the Greek gods, and says, what should I do? And in this play, uh, Zeus says very clearly, you must go to Troy. So Agamemnon has a kind of absolute duty, uh, not only to recover Helen, who's his brother's wife, uh, but he has an absolute duty to avenge 
the uh, the stealing of Helen uh, and to sort of protect the honor, not just of his brother, but of his city, of Greece itself, because this is a gross violation of hospitality to abduct uh, the wife of a Greek princess, Helen of Troy, and take her, take her to Troy. So Agamemnon has an absolute duty to do this. Now, when he sets out to do it, the winds are terrible. Uh, he can't put his ships at sea. It's too dangerous. And, um, and so Agamemnon um, tries to figure out what's going on. Now, he's informed uh, by a prophet um, that Artemis, another god, is angry at him uh, and is demanding of him that he sacrifice his own daughter. Artemis says, I will not change the winds unless you sacrifice your daughter Iphigenia. Now, when Artemis is giving his reason for why he would impose such a horrific demand on the Greek king, Artemis says something extremely strange. He says that uh, he saw an omen, he, Artemis, saw an omen where two eagles fell upon a rabbit, a pregnant rabbit, and the eagles devoured the rabbit, and they devoured the rabbit's offspring. All the little baby rabbits were savagely cut to pieces by the eagle. And Artemis goes, this is why uh, you have to do this. Now, on the face of it, this seems a little bit weird. Uh, what would a dream about eagles and a rabbit have possibly to do with the Greek expedition to Troy? But here is where I think um, we see the greatness of Aeschylus, because... This um, dream is actually supposed to represent uh, what is about to happen in battle. The rabbit is, in fact, Troy. The eagle is the Greeks. So the Greeks, just like the eagle, are going to devour Troy, and they're going to commit, as I said earlier, atrocities against the Trojans. And those atrocities are going to be so outrageous that the gods are going to be infuriated by it. So it's almost as if what Artemis is saying to Agamemnon is you are going to become a very wicked man, a very hard man uh, in, at Troy. You're going, you and your troops are going to do very bad things over there. Well, if you're going to be that kind of person, then you need to become that kind of person now. And so, uh, so you know what? Take your daughter and show your heartlessness now by sacrificing her. Uh, and if you do, uh, we will clear the wind. Everything will be calm. You can sail to Troy. Now, the essence of Greek tragedy, we see this in Aeschylus, we see it later in Sophocles and others, is putting a man in a position where he has an impossible choice. Uh, Agamemnon, on the one hand, has, as I mentioned earlier, an absolute duty to go to Troy. Zeus has demanded it of him. He has no way to refuse that. On the other hand, as a parent, he has an absolute duty to his family. He has an absolute duty to his daughter. Um, for a father to murder his own daughter countermands everything that we know uh, and care about in family relations. So here is Agamemnon. And the remarkable thing about Greek tragedy is the fact that these choices are forced upon him and there's no way that he can get out of them. He has to choose one or the other. In fact, Zeus basically says that if you don't go to Troy, I will drive you mad. And in a sense, Artemis is saying is if you don't sacrifice your daughter, you can't go to Troy. So on the one hand, um, uh, by uh, following Zeus and sacrificing his daughter, which is the choice that Agamemnon makes, and he goes to Troy, he sets up the circumstances of his own murder. So we see here that Clytemnestra is not entirely wrong in what she does. She is retaliating for a barbaric act committed by her husband, uh, the murder of their own daughter. And so we see here in Greek tragedy that the fact that a choice is forced upon you in no way liberates you from the consequences of that choice. And it is the essence of human tragedy that when we're faced with choices that we must make, we are nevertheless not freed from the um, moral payback that comes from making those choices.